All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the keynote this morning. So I'm a freshly graduated PhD student from Martin's lab, and I worked a lot on the Scala compiler implementation, like the Scala free compiler. And today I just wanted to talk a little bit about some like details of the Scala type system that I found kind of fun and interesting, and I hope you enjoy it. So I'm going to start very simple with uh, just member lookup. So uh, like probably recognize this kind of code, like there's a prefix e, and then I'm calling some member foo on it. And I'd like to compute to know the type of e.foo. So what's the first thing I'm going to do? Uh, I'm going to look at what's the type of e itself, right? So imagine that e has type a. Now I have to look into a to figure out the type of foo. So suppose a is a trait with a method foo. Uh, so in that case, what's the type of e.foo? X, right. Easy. <laughs> okay, now let's go with a slightly more complicated example. So in this case, the prefix e has type c of x, where so c is some parameterized type. So again, to figure out the type of e.foo, we have to look into the definition of c. And from that, uh, we find again the type of foo, but now there's something a little bit more complicated going on because the type of foo is a of t, and t is a type parameter of c. So what's the type of e dot foo? A of x. And so what we're doing here is we're doing a type substitution, right? We are replacing t in the definition of foo by x because uh, of the argument that was passed in the prefix. So far, so good. Okay, now I'll change the topic a little bit and talk about intersection types. So uh, if you're not familiar with them, in Scala 3, you can write the type A and B. And what this means, if I have an expression of type A and B, it means that uh, from the point of view of a compiler, E must have both type A and type B. And if a compiler can figure that out, then you can say, okay, E has type A and B. So in practice, for example, if I have a class which extends both A and B, and I have an instance of that class, then its type is A and B, or that's like a super type of the type of the class. And notice here I'm using a, a comma. In Scala 2, you use with here, but in Scala 3, you can use a comma instead. Uh, but otherwise, it's the same. Uh, there's another difference is that in Scala 2, uh, the syntax A and B did not exist. You could write A with B, and uh, there's a slight difference here that I will explain in a bit. But now, back to uh, member lookup. <laughs> uh, but this time, the prefix uh, has type A and B. So here it gets a little bit more complicated to figure out the type of foo. We have to look into both A and B. So it's possible that foo is defined only on one side, and then we can just look for uh, the type of foo in that side, and that will be the type of E dot foo. But it could also be defined in both sides, and there might be different types. So what do you think the type of e.foo is here? Doesn't depend on the context here. So here, so in uh, A, foo has returns a value of type x, and in B, it returns a value of type y. No, <laughs> uh, but if I have a value which is both an A and a B, then whatever the implementation of foo is, it has to overwrite both of these methods. Say it louder. X and Y, X and y exactly. Uh, so the type of e.foo has to be X and Y. So the, computer, the compiler has to compute like, the intersection of the result types. So here I'm only seeing an example uh, without like parameters, but if both of these methods had the same parameters, like they both took an int, then foo would be a method that takes an int and returns x and y. Uh, over, however, if they took different uh, parameter types, like one took an int and the other took a string, then we wouldn't be able to like intersect them because basically they would be seen as overloads. And so depending on the argument you pass, uh, you would be calling one or the other. But as long as you have no arguments or all the arguments matches, then the, basically the definitions get merged together to figure out the type of the member. 
And so I told you I will show you the difference between Scala 2 and Scala 3. So in Scala 2, you'd write A with B, and the difference is the last one win, basically. So here, because B comes after A, then uh, the type of E.4 is Y. So this is really a very <laughs> subtle difference that most of the time doesn't matter, but it's uh, a little bit nicer in Scala 3 where the order doesn't matter, whereas in Scala 2, with is not commutative and the order matters. So just a, a fun fact. Um, and now you might be wondering, like earlier I said that we wrote in Scala 3, you can write class a b extends a comma b. Why don't we use the same syntax? Like why not write class a b extends a and b? Yeah, question? Oh, but just go ahead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's something going on here with inheritance that we cannot write class, well, writing class a b extends a and b would be problematic because we just say that and should be commutative. But inheritance, is not always commutative. Uh, and I'm going through an example to explain that. So here I have a base trait that has a print method, then I have two traits that both uh, implement this method. One returns L, the trait L, the other prints R, the trait R. And now I have a class that extends both of these things. So first, like, is this valid Scala? Yes. It's not valid Java. Like, if you did that in Java, it will complain, say, well, I have two overrides. I don't know which one to pick. The Scala is, yeah, sure, fine. <laughs> Uh, but then the question is, uh, well, then what does it print? R. <laughs> yes, so, well, do you know why it prints R? Uh, because you, you, you get the last implementation when you, when you have a conflict. Yeah, the so it's, it's basically that. So the, the way it works is uh, we have a, an algorithm called linearization, which takes like all the base classes, so the classes that you extend, and make, put them in a list. And then the order of the base classes determine like which override you pick when there's a conflict. Uh, and the way we compute the linearization is, so we start for base, so the linearization of base is very easy because base doesn't extend anything. So by default, that means it extends any ref. So the linearization of base is base itself followed by any ref. So here, uh, I'm, this is a list with two elements. This is the first one, the second one. Uh, then the linearization of L, uh, it starts with L, and it's followed by the linearization of base because L extends base. Same with a linearization of R. And then here it's a little bit more complicated because LR extends both L and R, and they have both have their own linearization. So we have this uh, funny operator here, which is a form of concatenation. So the linearization of LR is going to be first LR, then linearization of R concatenated with L. But using this funny operator here, which is a plus with an arrow over it, which is defined in the Scala spec, which just means if the same element appears in both sides, uh, only keep the one on the uh, right part. So here, um, the end result is we get LR, then in the linearization of R, there is R, then base, then any ref. But base and any ref are removed, and they're only kept on the right hand side. Um, so yeah, the, the intuition is like the things in the right are kept, but with more complicated examples, it can get trickier. So, okay, uh, I'm going to ask Nicola now, because he answered first, uh, what does this print? <laughs> no, <but it's laughs> yeah, no, you, we don't have to do it live right now, but uh, here we have LR and RL both extends L and R, but in different order. And then there's a class that extends both of them. And that's still valid Scala. Uh, and using the algorithm I just have shown, you, could, you can compute what print does. Uh, do, do you have an answer? I think it's L. I think it's R, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you go for it, uh, you, you'll find that uh, like the linearization of LR, RL uh, is the linearization of this thing followed by the linearization of that thing. Um, and then if you like, remove things from, from this side that appear on that side, like you end up with R before L. But you can, if you don't trust me, you can double check. <laughs> uh, and like, so knowledge is knowing that this is a thing and wisdom is like not relying on it uh, in your own code base, uh, I would say. So this is just a, a fun fact. Uh, and now I'd like to move to another topic, which is union types, which are a new fun feature in Scala 3. 
So here I have E of type A or B. And union types are like the dual of intersection types. So what uh, it means for the compiler is it can say that E has type A or B if it knows that A has E has either type A or type B. Uh, so for example, if I have a list of uh, with uh, an int and a string, then I can type it as a list of int or string. Or if I have an if then else, then with like if something then one else uh, hello, then I can type it as one or string. And like the main motivation for having these things in Scala is without them, you couldn't always compute the type of an if then else uh, without doing some very complicated approximations. Uh, whereas here it's like very simple, like the type of uh, an if then else where one branch is A and the other is B is A or B. But there's a bunch of use cases that then fall out of that. And now I'd like to go back to member lookup, but this time with uh, union type. So uh, here in the prefix, I have uh, a union, A or B, and they both define a method foo. And then the question is like, what's the type of e.foo? It's a trick question. Uh, yeah. So actually it's a type error. Uh, and we say, oh, foo is not defined. Uh, and this is a bit controversial, but basically the way we define things in Scala 3 is we say the members of A or B uh, are the members of the common base classes of A and B. And here, the only thing A and B have in common is they both extend any ref indirectly. Um, so, but they, they don't have actually a base thing that uh, contains foo. And why do we do it that way? Like actually in very early version of Scala 3, uh, this worked. Um, but we ended up reverting that. And mostly this is a little bit weird if we allow this because we're like, what's the meaning of foo here? Basically, the meaning of a method is defined by like the documentation comment on that method, hopefully. But if you have two methods, they have two different documentation comments, and then the meaning of this thing is going to be like the, the union of the documentation comments. So it will be kind of a weird thing to use because maybe this thing has a precondition that says I can only be used uh, on uh, um, even days of the week, and the other one says I can only be used in odd days of the week. Like you can have preconditions on your functions, you can have uh, post conditions, and maybe these things conflict. So in general, you cannot like combine random methods and expect just because they have the same name that the union of them has a meaning. But uh, people are free to, to disagree with that. <laughs> um, so the way it works, I you have a question? Yes, so if you... X or Y, yeah. So you could yeah, do uh, an if then else that, that works where you pattern match uh, on E to know if it's an A or B and then select the, um, the member manually. Because if that's meaningful, then yeah, you're allowed to do it. Just we don't do it by default. We don't try to make up a member of a union. So what you can do instead is have a base thing. And then since now A and B both extend base, and foo is defined in base, and hopefully there's some documentation in foo that say like what are valid implementations of foo, then both of these things have to be valid according to that thing, and we can just show the documentation comments for foo when you call e.foo and it is meaningful. Um, there's one actually limitation here, I think, where we the result type is going to be the result type in the base, but because both of these things are override the base, we could actually maybe give a better result type. So maybe in a future version of the compiler, we could do that. Okay, so now I want to move to another even more confusing topic, which is uh, wildcards. Um, so in uh, Scala 3, and even now in Scala 2, you can write E with a type, which is a parameterized type, but instead of passing an argument like int, you can put a question mark. So in Scala 2, you could use underscore too. And this is still supported, but we'd like to eventually deprecate that for question mark uh, because we'd like to reuse wildcards for other things maybe in the future. Um, but it's the same thing. So if, you have, if you've seen uh, underscore in uh, Scala 2, it's the same thing. So what's the meaning of this thing? So here it's a little bit trickier. Basically, this means that there is a type T such that E can be typed as C of T. And we might not know what that type is. But there, there is some type. 
Uh, for example, if I have an array of string, I could type it as array of question mark. And here I'm intentionally using array because it's invariant. And so wildcards become useful because if you have covariant type like lists, if I have a list of string, and if I want to forget the string, like hide it, I can type it as a list of any because of covariance. But when you have invariant things, you, you cannot do that. So you have to rely on wildcards. Um, and uh, wildcards can have bounds too. So I can say that my unknown type has to be a subtype of high. Uh, and they can also have upper bounds, just fun fact. Um, and now we get to the really <laughs> annoying part, which is well, how do you do member lookup? Uh, when you have a wildcard in the prefix. So again, we have to look up the um, parameters type, like what's the definition of foo in AA. So here it's a little bit different than before. Uh, AA has the foo is a val, and the type of a val is array of array of t. And now the question is, well, what's the type of e.foo? And that's what you'd think, but no, <laughs> that doesn't work. And uh, but it's okay that you think that because this has been very confusing to every person who has ever worked on the Java or Scala compilers, and there's been numerous bugs related to that. But basically, wildcards cannot be substituted uh, freely like that. And to convince you of that, I'm going to show you how this leads to a crash if you were to do that. Uh, so again, we have the same class as before. Uh, and then I make an instance of that class with an array of array of int. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, hide this int behind a wildcard. So far, so good. And now I'm going to call e.foo. And suppose that we say, okay, this is array of array of question mark. That seems innocent. But now that I have this array of array of question mark, I can start mutating it. In particular, I could write an array of string uh, to replace my array of int here. But now I still have a reference to A. So I can access uh, A.foo to access the, my array, which is supposed to be an array of array of int. But now it's, uh, it's not an int. I put a string in there, so I get a crash at runtime. So is it not just the array? No, it's like any invariant thing. Like you run into the same issue where like you, you can demonstrate the same thing. Like the reason array is invariant is to prevent that kind of things. So the type that you can use instead is array of some unknown type, which is a subtype of an array of some unknown type. And if you do that, then you cannot start writing into it because you don't know the uh, element type of the array. Whereas here, you know, oh, it has to be an array of some type. Uh, and we can actually give a better type than that, and I'll show that near the end. All right, and now I'd like to introduce the last type concept, which you might be familiar with, which is type members. And just uh, as a recap, I can show how they compare are related to type parameters. So here, here I have a class A, and I could either have a type member T or type parameter T, and then I could use them in the same way in the body of A, right? And then when I make an instance of A, I can have a refinement which says all T is equal to int, or I can have a type parameter. And then if I want to hide the int, like maybe it's a, a detail, an implementation detail, then uh, it's, that's where things are getting a little bit different, where with the type member, I can just not have a refinement. But with the type parameter, I have to put a question mark here. And then uh, when I have this y, and I want to call foo on it, uh, something interesting happens where uh, when I have the type member, then I can get a more precise type. Because here, y.foo or a of question mark, then I don't know anything about t, so I get any back. But here I know that uh, t is some unknown type, but it's the unknown type defined in y. And so I can sometimes use that to get more precise um, types. So how does this work exactly? Uh, let's go back to our member lookup example. So this time, the prefix. Uh, is x and has type a. And if we look into a, uh, we see um, it has a type member t, and then foo uh, has an array of t. And then uh, we want to compute x dot foo. So how do we do this computation? And the way this works is actually this thing, t here, is syntactic sugar for this dot t. Like this is a path-dependent type. 
and the way we compute the type of x.foo is we do a substitution again, but this time we're substituting uh, terms. So we're substituting this by the prefix. Uh, and we get array of x.t. Uh, but uh, if you notice here, I have a val. And uh, if I didn't have a val, then suddenly uh, things don't work because if I have a def e, I cannot substitute this by e because e dot t isn't a valid type like path dependent types. They have to start with a val as a prefix because like, it's supposed to be represent the member of a value, not a member of some random call to a method. So what can we do? Um, imagine, so the question, the, the basically the way we want to solve this is we want to somehow transform this expression to get back to the original case. Like, re do, you, do you see how we could do that? So the trick is uh, we're going to introduce a val, a temporary one. So we're going to say, OK, e is a def, but I can store it into a val. And then I can call uh, tmp.foo, and then I can start computing types. So the type of tmp is going to be a because the type of e is a. And then the type of tmp.foo is going to be array of tmp.t, right? Uh, as we've seen before, like we do the substitution, and now that's legal because tmp is a val. Uh, but we still have a problem here, right? Uh, because tmp never appeared in user code. That's something the compiler just made up. Uh, and we don't want that to appear like in types inferred by the compilers because like what does it mean? But this isn't a problem that's limited to that because every time you make a block in Scala, you can have lo local definitions, you can have local values, local classes. And so the compiler needs to have some logic to do type avoidance, to like compute a super type of this thing which does not refer to this variable which doesn't exist outside of this block. So what do you think we should use as the type of a block? We could use any, but we do always work right. But what's the most precise type we can use? It's array of a wildcard. <laughs> so we get back to the wildcard now. Uh, so that's how the wildcards can be useful and how the compiler sometimes has to infer them to like hide some types uh, that's not available outside of the scope where it's defined. Fun, right? <laughs> Uh, and now, uh, for my last uh, trick, I want to show you, we'll get back to our wildcard example. So if you remember, I told you, oh, well, you, you cannot substitute wildcards. And then I left it at that, but I didn't say what, what we should do, or what to do. Uh, you could emit an error. That's, I think that's what Java does in this example. It will say, well, no, I cannot call foo uh, because there's a wildcard here. <laughs> uh, I don't know what to do. But in Scala 3, what we do instead is we have this trick where we say, okay, well, um, the question mark by itself, we cannot substitute, but type parameters, they're kind of like type members. And in fact, inside the compiler, type parameters, we represent them like type members. So we can say that the type of x, maybe we could say it's like array of x dot t, <laughs> which looks very wild, wild, uh, weird, right? Because it's like kind of recursive, uh, but it's fine. <laughs> Uh, and the user cannot write this because you cannot call, like you cannot pretend that type parameters are type members in Scala because you might have like multiple classes in your class hierarchies with the type of same type parameter with the same name, so you don't know which to call, but the compiler internally basically does that. Uh, <laughs> and because we, we do that, then we can actually do the substitution thing. So we can say, okay, well, the type of x.foo is array of array of x.t. And then Actually, the compiler right now can infer these things, but maybe we can hide them. Like, if you wanted to hide them, then you go again and do the same trick as before. You do uh, use a wildcard to, to replace it afterwards uh, and make sure, oh, but this thing is in an invariant position, so I need another wildcard. Um, and then, yeah, if x, like here, x is a val again, but if it was a def, then again, you do the same trick as before where you uh, make a temporary val. And that's how we type wildcards. So that's why wildcards are, are so tricky. But I think at least now in Scala 3, we have like a principled way of doing it. 
and uh, hopefully we won't be plagued with all the bugs related to work that exist, especially in Java. For example, when Java, every time they add a feature, they tend to have new bugs with work cards, like with lambdas, uh, they found new bugs because they had like assumptions about what could be in work cards and what could not be, uh, but like basically did not hold. And I think now we have this uh, principal solution, we should be safe. Uh, and you might ask, like, well, okay, well, is there any point in doing all this work to be able to uh, call methods on things with wild cards? Because there isn't really, like, you could, <laughs> you could always do some more boilerplate to avoid that. You can always use a method with a type parameter and pass the thing with a wild card to the method with a type parameter. Um, but it's kind of fun. So, for example, it means that we can type this. So here I use this buffer instead of array for uh, just uh, doing a different example. And now uh, I have a list buffer and I don't know what's inside. But I can get an element of that, of that list buffer. Like I can use the first element and I can append it to that list buffer. Uh, and actually, that should be prepend. Oh, I should change that. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the types all work out. Like, even though we don't know what the type of um, the argument of list buffer is. It lets us take uh, an element inside the list buffer and pass it and append it back into the same list buffer because basically x dot apply zero is going to be typed as x dot t and x dot append is going to take an x dot t as argument. Uh, and that's all I had. <laughs> uh, I like there's many more things I could talk about like um, type inference and. Um, a member lookup when you have co implicit conversions or when you have um, uh, structural types, but I'll leave that for another time. And I'll leave you with some resources. So the slide for this talk are online. The Scala free language reference uh, has some of what I just told, but not everything. Like we need to actually make it more complete. I have a talk on type inference. Uh, we have a channel on YouTube about like compiler uh, hacking. We do uh, like get people to work on the compiler. And there's a contributors channel on the Scala Discord to talk about the compiler. And then there's my thesis, <laughs> which I don't recommend reading. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you, you find some related stuff in there about a very small subset of Scala that I formalized. Thank you. And um, happy to answer any questions.